and I'm happy to uh, introduce uh, Michael Witthoft, uh, who just told me has been in mind for 14 years now <laughs> for various positions, which I think is uh, cool to see as well from an academic career standpoint that you can spend a lot of time um, at a place you really like. Um, but apart from Mainz, he has also worked in Basel and in Mannheim and at the King's College in London and has obtained his PhD in 2007 and has been a professor of clinical psychology since 2014 in Mainz, Germany, and is also a clinical psychotherapist in behavior therapy. Um, yeah, and today, uh, I think we're going to hear something about the expectancies and persistent somatic symptoms, which I'm really excited about. So, um, yeah, the so stage is yours. You can share your screen if you like, and then we can get started. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lucas, for the kind introduction. I hope you can hear me properly, but I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share some of my views on topics they are of interest for you and for me, I guess. Um, so, so let me start from a clinician perspective. Um, at, at the beginning of my clinical training, I, I was seeing um, a patient in Mannheim um, who consulted our clinic, and I, I will never forget the first contact with him. He was knocking at my door, and he said to me, Hi, Mr. Wittoft, I'm so glad to meet you. You are such an expert. On, on this matter, and I'm, I'm sure you can help me because you're not such a loser as my former therapist. And um, as, as you can imagine, I was very naive uh, right at the start of my clinical training program, and I was flattered and intimidated at the same time. And as you can imagine, that became a very difficult journey. Um, why I'm telling this, uh, let's give you a bit of a detail. He was 60 years old. He had a history of, of many different multiple medically unexplained symptoms at that time, like burning sensations in the eyes, uh, multiple pains, gastrointestinal problems, and they started um, around the age of 30 in his case. And he also had a history of um, adverse childhood experiences. So um, his father was chronically ill. Um, his, his mother developed a postpartum psychosis after giving birth to his brother. And because the parents were not able to look after the, both children, um, they had to spend a couple of years in a children's home. And even after returning, the, the mother threatened um, the family um, by committing uh, or, or saying she would commit suicide by leaving on the gas oven. And I, I tell you uh, this kind of a detail because I think it's related to, to the symptoms uh, Mr. B was, was developing later on. And he, he was traveling from, from doctor to doctor. He received many different kinds of diagnosis like chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, candida syndrome, and so forth. And at that time, we were doing research on multiple chemical sensitivity. And uh, that was the reason why he was um, consulting our clinic, because he developed the belief that his, his symptoms were the result of, of toxins, smells um, in the environment or in his house. And um, he, he met uh, medical doctors uh, confirming this, this belief as well. So, so at the beginning or before he came into treatment, he, he was sending me Excel files, very detailed um, about each and every minute, about each and every symptom. You see uh, parts of these reports here, um, and he, he had a kind of a strange morning ritual. The first thing in the morning after a very bad night um, would be he would open the window and and uh, rather not not um, seeing outside, he would smell outside, trying to detect any toxins in the air that came from people burning their waste in the neighborhood. Um, uh, what would explain why he had such a bad night? He would go into his car, drive around the neighborhood. But you can imagine most of the time he, he wouldn't see anything. And uh, so the search remained unsuccessful here. He had lots of compensatory behaviors. And um, he also went um, to specialized medical clinics um, that, uh, uh, that said they would detoxify him. And, and even after many years uh, speaking about these clinics, I, I find myself getting angry because they they were suggesting that they could detoxify 
and and cure him uh, by using different kinds of infusions. And as a young therapist, I was arguing with him. I I, uh, I was telling him, well, um, do not go into this clinic. So I, I made any kind of mistakes you could think of as a as a therapist. Um, but he he kept saying, well, these clinics are so helpful because um, uh, they uh, I feel much better when I'm there. Um, but after a couple of weeks and months, we were working together. He started asking questions, and that was very interesting. He asked me once, um, well, these clinics are great, you know, but some things make me wonder. So when I when I park my car outside the clinic, I already feel so much better, and they, they haven't started doing their treatments yet. So, so these were kind of um, thoughts and questions he developed over time. And... Uh, yeah, that's kind of a um, kind of a treatment uh, he received from medical doctors. I would say, out of desperation and helplessness, they re- recommended this book to him, which translates to the expert killer syndrome. So, um, not a very positive interaction, I would think, from a um, therapeutic perspective. So, so Mr. B started to ask questions and, and, uh, so did I. And you see the three main questions that are related, um, when, when I, um, meet patients like Mr. B. And uh, these are the questions I would like to focus a bit more in this talk today. Um, so what are we talking about? Uh, which is a question of labeling of diagnosis. Uh, let's call it the taxonomy question. How can we explain it? Um, a question about models and mechanisms. And finally, I'd like to say a few words about um, what are the treatment implications of, of these mechanisms? Um, so first questions, what are we talking about? Well, you know, there are diff- so many different labels and names for it. And I started with labeling it medically unexplained uh, symptoms. But this term came out of fashion because um, it, it's not very useful, as you can imagine. And um, currently, perhaps the most um, the most prevalent term is persistent somatic symptoms or PSS. And I consider it as a kind of an umbrella term because we find it as a core component in so many different conditions like if you go from left to right, um, we find it in somatic symptom disorder in the DSM-5. Um, we find it in the former category of somatoform disorders in the ICD um, or the DSM. We see it in functional somatic syndromes like fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, and so forth. And it's also um, in most of the patients with pathological health anxiety, their anxiety comes from um, somatic sensations um, uh, that they cannot explain properly. And of course, we find it in other mental disorders from depression, over anxiety, panic disorder, tremulous anxiety disorder as well. And not to forget also in, in medical conditions like asthma or cardiac problems or chronic pain conditions. And if you're interested in, in, in this um, type of um, symptoms, there, there's an excellent a recent review in the Lancet uh, by Bernd Löwe and, and colleagues uh, from the Hamburg group. And um, yeah, if if we look at data-driven taxonomies, um, personally, I think the hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology or high top, which you see here is, is most promising because it's, as I said, it's um, data-driven, it's hierarchical, it's dimensional, and therefore it solves many of the problems we have in categorical diagnostic systems like uh, comorbidities, arbitrary boundaries, and so on. And as you can see on the left-hand side, I hope you can see my arrow, um, there, there is a, a, a dashed line around the somatoform category, which means that this is the area where we have um, uh, far little research compared to the other domains here. And um, we even do not know whether this um, part here can be separated properly from the internalizing spectrum. So because there is huge overlap and um, there are suggestions to form a super spectrum on top of um, this spectrum level below the level of the super spectrum of general psychopathology on top. And the the um, the commonality seems to stem from problems in in emotional processing, in emotional um, regulation, and so on. So if we if we zoom a bit further in into this um, somatoform um, area here, you can see five subdomains, 
um, which are the result of uh, factor analysis. Um, we have the core component of bodily distress. Um, then we have a special type of symptoms like the functional neurological symptoms, uh, problems with hearing, seeing, motor problems and that are not related to somatic pathologies. Then we have somatic preoccupation. That means a, a overly strong body focus. And we have health anxiety and disease conviction on the right hand side, which are related to the former diagnosis of hypochondriasis. Now, as said, there is um, quite some overlap uh, between internalizing problems and somatic symptoms. And that's what you can see here in this quite substantial correlation. On the y axis, you have the somatic symptoms. On the x axis, you have symptoms of depression uh, measured with a, a BDI here. And, and so this is a, a quite strong correlation, just showing that um, uh, if, if you have uh, uh, symptoms of depression, you're very likely uh, to also have numerous bodily sensations or symptoms here. Um, what's interesting is that this is not only limited to internalizing symptoms, but if we look at, at another super spectrum from the area of psychosis, and this is data from the general population, you find somatic symptoms, uh, which are depicted here on the um, uh, on the uh, x-axis, to be uh, correlated uh, with um, facets of psychosis like schizotopy and hallucinations as well. So I think this is um, uh, uh, quite plausible if you if you um, uh, remember the general factor on top of the high top model, meaning that all of these facets are intercorrelated substantially. All right, let's let's go go back to the uh, somatoform spectrum and to the first facet, which I said um, is the core component in in our view. And um, just a bit of a um, information how we measure it. Most of you are familiar with the PHG15, which is just a list of the most common somatic symptoms. And um, uh, our work um, was was uh, also looking for the most plausible um, psychometric structure because we thought. If we find a good fitting structure to these kind of data, um, we we would be able to to find out a little bit more about the mechanisms as well. And the result of our psychometric and structural analysis um, using structural equation modeling um, uh, that's the bifactor model you see here. And the the specialty of the bifactor model is that it's it's basically a variance decomposition of the symptoms or the symptom variants you find in the middle here, like stomach pain, back pain, and so on, which means that uh, the variability in each and every symptom is determined by two independent factors. On the right-hand side, you have the more specific sensory aspects. Um, and on the left-hand side, um, you have a G factor, um, which is, or which we call the effective motivational uh, facet of symptom perception, um, because it's common across um, all kinds of symptoms and symptom patterns. Um, we, we, we are quite lucky that this structure has been replicated numerous times by different groups with different instruments, with questionnaires and interview data. And, and so we, we, we kind of believe that this is a robust uh, structure as a starting point for further mechanistic um, investigations. And um, also what What's nice, I think, is that this structure about specific and common pathways um, maps a bit of the neurophysiological pathways. Uh, that's an example from Dirk de Ridder's work on, on auditory um, and tinnitus phenomena and so on. And what we see here at um, the example of auditory and nociceptive perception is that we have highly specific lateral pathways as well as um, common pathway in the middle, which which might resemble a kind of a salience um, matrix here. So this is, um, in our view, also nicely fitting the, the bifactor idea. And uh, as a bit of a proof for why we call the general factor the effective motivational factor, I listed some of the constructs and traits that we found being um, substantially correlated with this G factor, but not so much with the sensory factors on the right hand side. All right, so so now that we we have a bit of a view on the structure, on the organization of persistent somatic symptoms, I'd like to focus a bit more on on the model and mechanism question here. And um, the first question is: 
do we have the right explanatory constructs? And, and there are many of them. I, I, I just listed some of them here. And I'd like to focus um, particularly on the first two negative expectations and the role of negative effect, which is overlapping, but, but not identical in my view. And many of those components um, uh, you may remember from, from very famous models from the area of CBT or behavioral medicine. And um, perhaps one of the most seminal models here from Kermeyer and Telefer, um, one of the earliest models, you see they, they start with physiological disturbances as kind of an input and then go to cognitive variables. That, that means there is a physiological reaction. This reaction is detected. And then via catastrophization, there, there's a kind of a vicious circle developing. Um, and from, from our current perspective, I would say the problem with these models is that they do not explain in detail how somatic sensations come about in our cognitive system. They, they rather start with the assumption that there are somatic symptoms. And that's the first problem. The second problem is that they, um, they hypothesize that you need physiological disturbances to end up in such a vicious circle. And, and that's not very proven by, by current data. Therefore, I think the, the model by Richard Brown, a colleague from Manchester that was long working in neurology at uh, um, University College in London, um, he de further developed a model which is more precise in terms of the cognitive components you see, such a thing as, as symptom representations in the middle and those symptom representations like memory structures uh, can be activated by um, by automatic processes of attention allocation in the cognitive system. And I think this is much closer to the experimental data we have already. And the, the final step in, in further developing such models, I would think, is the predictive processing perspective done by Omer van den Berg and our group. And uh, I will go into data uh, I will go into detail about this model a bit later on. But before doing that, uh, let me let me just go back. So so I think the models we were using in CBT um, to explain what's going on and to to derive treatment strategies were very much focused on stimulus response patterns, like um, stimuli, like mental images, threats, thoughts were causing a somatic reaction. And and this model is very much um, influenced by the the very famous cognitive model of uh, um, of David Clark uh, from panic disorder. Yeah, but the problem again with those models is that they they do not deliver an explanation how symptoms develop in the in the cognitive system. And I think one of the missing links here um, is the the component that becomes before a stimulus is detected. Let's call it a kind of an expectation or a prior or a mental model, which is necessary to to process what's um, coming uh, later in, in the different stages, and that uh, fits nicely, I think, um, our current um, current view is how the human mind works, not like a, a passive data processing organ light you see on the right-hand side, but rather as an actively operating um, uh, a kind of uh, device that starts by, by creating intentions and actively searches and constructs um, uh, perceptual uh, impressions and, and conscious percepts. All right, so so let me let me um, elaborate a bit on uh, the expectation component and how I myself came across the power of expectations, so to speak. And uh, it's it's just a brief question for you. Uh, can you develop somatic symptoms from the exposure to everyday electromagnetic fields from Wi-Fi, from cell phone radiation, or so on? And um, not sure whether whether any one of you would would say yes or maybe. Um, if we if we look in the general population, you you might be surprised that we uh, we find eight to nine percent um, of of people reporting such. Um, uh, such ideas or or beliefs, and um, so if we if we look at the Western world, this is um, older data, uh, but we have newer data collected just and and it looks very similar. We we seem to be on top in Germany really in, uh, regarding this question, which is interesting because it's it's so far beyond what we know from research, and this is 
uh, a double blind provocation study from James Rubin and Simon Wesley's lab at King's, um, showing that that um, people that report being sensitive to, to electromagnetic fields are not able to detect the presence of such a signal at all. So we, we do not have evidence that such signals can be detected. We do not have evidence that they lead to symptom reports or any other adverse health effects at all. So um, there are reviews. It's not only a single study. There are reviews. And in light of this evidence, um, it, it always surprises me that you also find um, quite new articles like this one in, in highly respected, high-impact journals um, as saying that Wi-Fi radiation is responsible for some of the most problematic aspects of human health. But they are still out there. And I think they are feeding also the press, um, like this is an article from The Guardian a couple of years ago. Even the serious outlets uh, try to, to present some sensational single case studies from, from time to time. And at that time in London, we were very interested. Um, are those media reports able to, to create the phenomenon of being hypersensitive to electromagnetic fields? Um, so what we did was a, a simple experimental study. We invited people from the general population in London uh, coming to our lab and we randomly assigned them to do to uh, to media reports like on the left hand side uh, you see this is a, a documentary that was highlighting the potential dangers of electromagnetic fields and later on it was discussed very controversial but at that time it was seen by by millions of people in the UK because it's, it's a very respected format the BBC Panorama documentary and we had a control condition that did not focus on, on such um, health effects of Wi-Fi at all, just uh, for comparison. After the film, we presented a sham exposure um, to our participants. And after that, we were recorded uh, symptoms, beliefs, as dependent variables again. So just to, to give you an idea what, what uh, people were confronted in terms of media reports, uh, I, I just try to present you one minute of, of this documentary here. I hope, hope that works. 30 years of research. How many studies are there out there? And I would say there must be two or three thousand at least. He did his own review of all the experiments on mobile phones to see how many found an effect. It's about 50-50. 50% found effect and 50% did not find any uh, effect at all. Dr. Gerd Oberfeld from Salzburg, a government scientist who's calling for Wi-Fi to be removed from schools in Austria. He too has found health effects at similar levels of radiation to Wi-Fi. If you go into the data, you can see a very, very clear picture. It's, it's like a puzzle and, and everything thing fits well together from DNA breaks, DNA damage, up to... Uh, animal studies and up to the uh, epidemiological evidence that shows, for example, increased symptoms as well as increased cancer rates. And now there's a bit of scary music. So it's really scary, isn't it? And um, But it's wrong. It's, it's actually wrong, but it, it shows the recipe, how these media reports are partly created. You, you have a sensational hypothesis and you find a couple of professors um, that represent their position um, creating a false balance. And we, we had that uh, example um, uh, also for other topics. So so what happened? Um, oh yeah, this. so after receiving the documentary, people received the sham exposure. You see a strange German guy here with an antenna on, on his head, which became the experimenter later on then. And so we, we really tried to, to build an environment that looked a bit scary with a router, which looked like we had done something to it. Um, and the instruction that I gave participants was, um, I'm now going to switch on a very strong Wi-Fi signal, a new signal. We would like to test it. And please keep track of what's happening in your body over the next 15 minutes. It's totally harmless but I'm going to leave the room for the 15, next 15 minutes. And if it's getting too strong, please tell me, I will switch it off immediately. So that was the instruction. After that, participants were left alone with the instruction to focus on their um, bodily processes. And that was the question we were asking um, afterwards. Please indicate how much the sensations and symptoms you may have experienced are attributable to the electromagnetic field. And almost half of them 
said, well, there was nothing at all, which I would attribute to, to it because they were right. There was nothing at all. But more than half said there was, there was somewhat or a strong signal or a great deal. And what's, what's not in this data here, um, two of the participants asked me to switch off the signal because they were getting a headache and they said, it's, it's getting too strong. Um, please switch it off. And that at that time, I, I never expected um, to find such a strong effect, to be honest. Of course, we debriefed participants afterwards and, and none of them um, kind of became angry. They, they became interested in the phenomenon itself. Um, so, so I think that's an important part due to ethical um, reasons here. Um, again, that's showing that symptom reports um, increased from before to after the sham exposure here. And I have to add that the media report didn't have a very strong main effect. Um, the media report only affected those people coming in the experiment already with higher levels of state anxiety. So we, we only found an interaction effect, which I think makes sense because it, it uh, and, and it's a good news that it's, it's not enough to see a scary media report to develop electromagnetic hypersensitivity. Um, but it's rather, you need a combination of, of an anxious anticipation um, to, together with, with um, kind of scary information um, to create this phenomenon in the laboratory. And um, we, we are quite happy that this, this kind of effect has been replicated by an Australian group. And uh, we also um, did it when I was back in Mainz um, uh, in, in, uh, in a different experiment where we looked at uh, can painful or, or uh, weak electromagnetic or, or electric stimuli, can they be modulated by this scary Wi-Fi instruction? And that's also the case um, that we've seen in this study. So all these experiments have been, actually have been done before we, we had the models, um, which I will talk about now. But um, in, in hindsight, I think those models fit excellently um, what we have seen in those experiments. Like um, somatic symptom reports seem to be associated with a prior, with an expectation, with an internal mental model. And this internal mental model is just compared to sensory input and the combination from the prior model with the sensory input leads then to posterior, um, which we would call the, the symptom experiences here, here in, in yellow. And depending on the position of the prior model or the sensory input, this posterior is shifted um, rather to the prior in this case, because the prior um, is, is more reliable, is more precise. Um, otherwise, if the sensory input would be more precise, the model would be shifted um, in the direction of the sensory input. And, and having, having this predictive processing view, um, we're also thinking about how does our psychometric work with a bifactor model fits into, into these processes. At the moment, we think that our general factor, which you see on the left hand side, might be stronger related to the, uh, uh, to the prior model, whereas the sensory factors might be stronger related to the sensory input component. But, but that's only speculative at the moment. And um, in, in order to, to test the central predictions of such a predictive processing model for, uh, for symptom perception, um, we used a device which is called the thermal grill illusion of pain. Actually, the, the credit for this goes to Anne Brescher, you see on the right hand side, because she has she had, um, the, the great idea that this thermal grill device would be excellently suited to test central predictions. And I, I try to briefly explain why. So what's happening here is in this device, you have uh, pipes that are filled with water and you can regulate the temperature of this water because the, the pipes are connected to pumping systems on each side. And so you can either fill it with cooler water, you can fill it with warmer water, or you can mix the two conditions in an alternating order. And this is the critical condition here because if you would uh, place your hand um, on the third condition here. Most of you would uh, would have a slightly burning sensation, which gives the name to this kind of illusion. So, so why did we think that this is suitable for testing predictive processing um, hypothesis? Well, 
we, we think that the two conditions you see here with the homogeneous cooler pipes or warmer pipes, they represent a rather precise sensory input. Whereas if we go to the mixed condition, we, we think that this is a rather unprecise sensory input. And the unprecise input should shift the perception um, towards the prior belief, which is not the case if you use a more um, precise sensory input here. So what we did was um, we, we had a convenient sample of 64 participants coming into the lab. We manipulated uh, the prior um, by using different instructions, first a neutral instruction, a positive instruction like the sensation you will have will be will be um, very relaxing, very positive, or a nocebo instruction it might be slightly painful. Our dependent variable was just an intensity rating recorded on a visual analog scale from 0 to 200. And we looked at moderators like neuroticism or trade negative effectivity and absorption in this experiment. And you see um, how, how the nocebo condition was instructed. And it was a within participants manipulation. That means every participant received all of the three conditions, uh, but everyone started with a neutral condition and the order of the positive and negative instruction was randomly um, determined here. Now coming to the results, um, it becomes more obvious in this slide here. Um, we had a clear main effect. You see on the y-axis, the intensity ratings on the x-axis, um, the different um, instruction conditions like neutral, placebo, and nocebo on the right-hand side. And you see that the thermal grill condition with the mixed temperatures um, created by far the, the more intense ratings compared to the other two cool or warm conditions. So, so the manipulation seemed to work. And we also found a significant nocebo effect. That means the negative instruction created more intense feelings, um, particularly in the mixed condition here. And perhaps most interestingly was that the, the modulation um, of the nocebo instruction of the intensity rating um, was moderated by the level of trade anxiety or neuroticism, which you, which you see here. Um, and the same was true for absorption as a personality trait, which means absorption like uh, being prone to unusual experiences. And um, for both of these um, personality traits, we found a significant moderation. What does it mean in the predictive processing model? Well, in our view, it nicely fits the idea, which is here um, postulated by Omar Vandenberg and colleagues, that negative affect um, kind of biases information processing in a better safe than sorry fashion. Uh, which makes the, the um, prior stronger compared to the sensory input. That means in light of negative effective situations or stimuli, the processing is more relying on internal mental models and the, the processing of external or internal sensory input becomes weaker and, and um, uh, not, not that uh, influential anymore. That, that brings me um, to, to negative affect more generally. And uh, so, so the question, what's the role of negative affect when it comes to symptom perception or symptom creation? And I think the other way around from what it's depicted here, it's, it's far more plausible. Somatic symptoms create negative affect, right? Um, but how, how about the other way? Does negative affect create somatic symptoms? That, that wasn't so clear for a long time. And um, again, there's a nice experimental paradigm from Oma Vandenberg's group. Uh, most of you are familiar with it, with the effective picture paradigm here. And it's, it's very simple. That means participants receive series of pictures that are either neutral, positive, negative, or symptom related in the original study. Just as examples here. And after a series of pictures, um, um, you're asked to rate your somatic sensations um, on a list. And what you typically find is that um, people that that have high symptom reports in daily life, this is the light crew, uh, the, the light uh, gray bar here. They show um, quite significant increases in somatic symptoms after viewing negative or symptom-related pictures. And 
So, so it's not important whether the pictures are symptom related and um, the, the negative valence seems to drive the effect here. And there's a more recent study um, that was uh, combined with fMRI technology. And um, in this study, uh, two groups were compared a patient group uh, with functional disorder patients like fibromyalgia and irreparable bowel syndrome was compared to healthy controls. And you see on the left-hand side, the behavioral data um, and you see dramatic increases in symptom reports in the patient groups when viewing negative pictures, which is not that obvious, only a small effect in the healthy control group. And what's interesting is that in this study, um, um, the, the mediators uh, in terms of, of um, brain activation levels were, were kind of demonstrated by showing that um, the, the activation patterns while viewing negative pictures seem to strongly overlap with the activation in nociceptive um, systems for the patients only. That means patients show large overlaps between activation patterns in emotional processing areas and nociceptive processing areas, whereas in healthy controls, these two um, uh, pattern or response patterns are, are more separated. Yeah, th this is kind of what has been the main result of this study here. So we, we took this paradigm and we tried to um, test it in a, in a bit of a more heterogeneous sample um, among members of the general population that was done in a, um, a EU project, innovative training network that uh, just came to an end two months ago. And uh, so we had 245 participants in this study, and we used a bit of a modified version of the picture paradigm um, to, to compute reliability, to use it in structural equation modeling. And we first did a manipulation check, and as you can see, it worked quite well. The negative pictures evoked far more symptom reports, and we found also clear effects of valence and arousal in this model. So, we, we now try to combine it to our psychometric findings. First, um, you see a latent correlation with a high top somatoform factor here, meaning that uh, people with higher levels on somatoform uh, symptoms um, also show stronger effects in the effective picture paradigm. And if we, if we connect it to our bifactor model um, of the PHQ15, um, this is partly unexpected. What we would have expected is a significant correlation between the G factor, the effective motivational component of symptom perception. Um, what we didn't expect was a quite strong correlation with the cardiopulmonary symptom factor, showing that um, the picture paradigm seems to create kind of sensory input, which is related um, to the sensory facet of symptom perception in the PHQ15. So by, by seeing those relations between effective picture processing and somatic symptom reports, I think it's, it's tempting to, to speculate that um, high symptom reporters or people with multiple um, somatic symptoms show stronger emotional reactions or have just problems in emotion regulation. And luckily, we had um, another study going at that time, which was done by Katharina Schnabel, um, a PhD student in Mainz, and she recruited uh, 62 patients with somatic symptom disorder and, co um, and compared them on, on different measures of emotion regulation to a group of matched healthy control participants. And I do not have time to go into detail with that, but we, we use kind of standard tasks to, to measure emotion regulation performance um, like reappraisal, suppression observation as a control condition in the lab. And we, we, we hardly found any difference when we looked at performance uh, measures of emotion regulation. Um, no differences in terms of behavioral measures, no differences in terms of psychophysiological measures, no differences in terms of regulatory choice as well. And um, the, the large differences we observed were all limited to self-report measures of emotion regulation, um, which is interesting. We At the moment, we, we do not have very good explanations for this discrepancy between performance-based measures and self-reports measures. But I think important is that the patients do not seem to suffer from generalized deficits when it comes to emotion regulation performance. 
All right, let me let me come to the third question. How how can we use this this knowledge about mechanisms, about structure, um, to to treat patients with PSS um, more effectively? And I think the the problem here is if we look at the effect sizes of our available treatments, that we are far less effective in treating somatoform disorders compared to affective and anxiety disorders, and and that has multiple reasons. One of the reasons I think is nicely demonstrated in the review paper by Maria Kleinstoiber, a former colleague from Mainz. And, um, and I think she nicely shows in, in this review that um, most of the research on functional disorders and uh, somatic symptoms is done in biomedical research with very, very little studies uh, focusing on psychological factors, social factors, or their combination in terms of a biopsychosocial model. I think that's part of the problem we face here. If we, I think if we take the mechanism research seriously, it would mean that we should focus on decreasing the reliance on strong somatic symptom priors. We could do that by increasing the salience of sensory input, making sensory input more precise. And we should um, aim at decreasing negative affective states because we've seen that negative affective information processing towards overly dominant symptom priors. So what we did in the past, I think is a bit in line of, of um, what we would suggest. This is a study um, of patients with pathological health anxiety and half of them were advised to do a body scan regularly over two weeks. Um, using electronic diaries, and they should do nine body scans focusing on body sensations, looking for symptoms, and trying to find normalizing attributions nine times a day over the course of two weeks. And uh, the control group was just uh, without training, waiting for regular therapy that both groups would um, uh, would get afterwards. And just to make sure what we did here was something for many people being very counterintuitive. Why, why should we tell people with hypochondriasis to focus strong on their bodily sensations? Most of the people at that time would have said, well, you need to tell them to distract their attention from bodily processes. But we thought it might be beneficial to increase the, the sensory input to focus on normal bodily sensations as a kind of introceptive exposure. And the findings, as you can see, after the two weeks, um, the group with the electronic diary had significantly lower values on health anxiety. Um, we, we hoped for it, um, and we didn't expect this effect to, to hold even after the, the CBT um, treatment. So such, such um, uh, kind of interventions might be beneficial during a waiting period um, until people receive a proper therapy. Just a short note on on uh, post-COVID, uh, which is a very controversial condition. Um, a medical colleague, Paul Garner, reported about his own um, uh, kind of experiences uh, and how he recovered from, from long COVID. Um, you are familiar with it, probably in the BMJ. And there, there have been colleagues trying to translate the predictive processing model um, to this area of long post-COVID. And I think that makes um, perfect sense. And uh, we also tried to adapt a CBT manual that that uh, Maria Kleinstoiber um, combined. Um, we tried to adapt it to post-COVID. We did a pilot study uh, with two neurological rehabilitation clinics and found um, uh, quite um, positive findings in terms of is it, it was very well accepted. Uh, basically, therapists have been more skeptic about it compared to the patients. And it seems to be able to reduce levels of fatigue. And uh, we, are, we are currently uh, doing a RCT study in our outpatient clinic in Mainz, um, trying to, to find more or testing the evidence for this intervention for outpatients coming to us with post-COVID. Um, this is just brand new data and, and um, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, preliminary, therefore, do not believe too much in it, but I thought it would be interesting sharing anyway. What, what we are doing here is we, we try to look at the effects of physical activity versus rest um, on the effective picture paradigm. So we, um, we repeated the picture paradigm multiple times before the intervention, after cycling and after rest for the first two groups here. And uh, just to see what, what physical activity does with the effective picture paradigm effect. 
And this is, as I said, provisional data. If we split the group in high and low symptom reporters, the high symptom reporters in red, um, you see that in the resting condition, we find a quite strong picture paradigm effect as an indicator of symptom activation in their memory, which kind of drops after um, going five minutes on the bicycle ergometer. And we only find this effect if we start with the resting condition. So if we start with the activity, uh, no difference becomes obvious. I'm very cautious because I said this is preliminary data, but it might show that activity is able to decrease the activation of symptom reports in, in memories. And we try to further test this hypothesis also using VR equipment. This is a, a very nice paradigm from the colleagues in Oxford. We are collaborating with Kyle Patterson and his group. And what's nice here is that uh, by using virtual reality and the bike ergometer, you can you can really independently adjust the precision of the prior or the, the quality of the prior, as well as the, the physical effort in terms of sensory input. And in this study, um, they used it to, to predict breathlessness, which was predicted almost equally by the prior manipulation as well as the physical um, uh, uh, the, the physical resistance of the bike. And we would like to, to translate it into fatigue as a, as a dependent variable. This is how it works. It's not that important. Let me just let me briefly summarize. Um, we think that persistent somatic symptoms are produced by repetitive activation or disinhibition of an inner model. Um, we think that expectancies in terms of priors of symptoms are activated uh, by, by cues and become self-fulfilling prophecies in terms of a posterior model. We also think that this process is largely automatic um, and that cognitive uh, conscious processes like catastrophizing, worrying, and so on come relatively late in the causal chains and are rather products and not so much risk factors. Um, yeah, symptom experiences represent an active, constructive cognitive process, which is not necessarily related to somatic pathology. And symptom experiences can occur in the absence of stressors and associated physiological reactions. And I think that's particularly interesting because we think to over rely on the stress model when working with patients. And some of the patients come to us. And if we, if we try to use the stress analogy, they say, well, sounds Possible, but um, for the last two years, there was no stress anymore because I do not work anymore. I, I reduced any kind of activity, but the symptoms still go on. And I think that's nicely summarized in this um, model here. What happens is that at the beginning, symptoms are related to stress-related um, uh, psychophysiological processes or to organ pathology. But after a while, an, a mental model is created that becomes self-perpetuating and there's no need for, for the external or stress-related um, somatic input in this model. I, I do not want to ignore criticism um, that refers to the predictive processing model here. Um, also, I, I do not have time to go into detail and I think what, what would be interesting would be to, to try to connect predictive processing models to what we know about working memory. Because I think that the crucial component is how are memory, um, uh, uh, parts of memory activated from long-term memory into working memory. I, I very much like Klaus Oberauer's work uh, from Zurich. And uh, so I think this would be helpful to, to combine these two lines of research. And I very much like these ideas that, that re remembering or activating memory content in working memory means that something is newly created and uh, like a different new representation. I think that's good news for treatment because by, by activating something, we can change it. And uh, for me, that, that's very interesting that memory is, is not so much about a backward operating process, that it's much more future driven and, and prospective uh, in nature. And I therefore thought I would end with a statement of the former Nobel Prize when I Louise Gluck saying, we look at the world once in childhood and the rest is memory. And I think that also attributes to symptom memories. Um, so I, I'd like to thank a number of friends and colleagues 
um, on the way and also to my wonderful team in Mainz and especially thanks to you for listening and for your interest. <laughs>